Today we will be speaking about modernism, an introduction to literary modernism in relation to the arts, in relation to the social and political and economical background, as well as the development of the sciences. So there are several definitions for modernism. One of them, by Lawrence Cahoon, goes like that. Modernism is a historically circumscribed movement in the arts during the period of the 1850s to the 1950s. We saw an unprecedented experimentation in the arts. This is not really a definition I would, um, I would uh, approve of since it stretches the beginning of modernism to a period where we saw the literary scenes seen in Britain was still dominated by realist uh, writing. So 1850 is too early in my opinion as a start date. Another one is this, modernism as an omnibus term, an umbrella term for a number of tendencies in the arts which were prominent in the first half of the 20th century. This is by Margaret Dreibel and it sets the time right because indeed um, the beginning, the first half of the century is um, in general the acknowledged uh, uh, chronology or, or time uh, frame for modernism. Um, then another one, modernism is not a movement but a large uh, wide range of artistic movements. It's distinguished by its opposition to traditional forms and to the aesthetic perceptions associated with those uh, forms. So this definition emphasizes the oppositional character of modernism as uh, rejecting its immediate parents, if you wish, uh, the um, uh, realist uh, tradition of the Victorian era. And uh, there is, uh, if we have to look at the uh, characteristics of modernism, um, according to Margaret Dreibel, there is an increased sense of cultural relativism, so um, the, the loss of certainties, if you wish, uh, then an awareness of the irrational and the workings of the subconscious mind, uh, the, uh, the, the mind we are not aware of, as was revealed, we will see this a bit later, in the works of um, psychoanalysts such as Sigmund Freud. And then of course there is an extraordinary uh, taste for experimentation and innovation. If we have to look at the chronology of uh, modernism, you can see that uh, not all art forms started about the same time. Probably the earliest uh, modernism we can see is the one that manifested itself in painting, where the works of um, uh, the Impressionist painters and that those of the uh, primitive painters such as Toulouse-Lautrec uh, were already around in the second half of the uh, previous century, the 19th century. Uh, poetry seems to have had a, 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 a jump start, an early start. Already in the first years of the century we have modernist uh, poets such as the Imagists in, in, in uh, America. The novel, at least in Britain, the modernist novel is closely related with the post First World War period, even if in France Proust uh, published his first um, volume of um, Remembrance of Things Past um, before the war. Um, let's have a look at a few landmarks of modernism. James Joyce's Ulysses, the Bible of uh, modernism, uh, was published in 1922 in Britain. Then Virginia Woolf's Mrs. Dalloway, uh, uh, also a remarkable uh, modernist book, was published in 1925. Uh, Aldous Huxley published Pound Counterpoint in 1928. Uh, George Orwell published his um, dystopian novel Animal Farm uh, immediately after the war in 1945. 
In between, if we take a look at the um, cross-Atlantic world at the United States, William Faulkner, the great American modernist, published uh, The Sound and the Fury uh, in 1929. And there's a late uh, modernist publication, the magnificent novel by the American John Steinbeck, East of Eden, was published in 1952. This is just a look at the fictional tradition of novel writing. And then we might mention outside of this, uh, in the poetic tradition, the, the major uh, work, major poem, The Wasteland, by T.S. Eliot, published in 1922. Uh, in America, the, Ameri the um, modernist uh, tradition in poetry is closely related with uh, Carl Sandburg, uh, who published his uh, Chicago poems in 1916. Now let's take a look at the historical context of modernism. Modernism appeared at a time of crisis. Europe was being shattered by the first global conflict, World War I. And it, uh, it, this was a conflict that created an incredible upheaval, an incredible chaos in, in Europe. It shattered everything. Uh, you have here images of the first moments of the war, uh, the generals, German generals who were at, at the um, initiation of this conflict, uh, the um, moment when, when Italy entered the war in 1915, and this is a, a picture from the, uh, from the mountain campaign, uh, and then soon most of Europe was engulfed in this horrible war. Uh, a, a war devoid of, of, of heroism, a war devoid of, of, of glory. Most of the combat war was like this, people lying in deep trenches in the mud and, and, and suffering ignoble disease and, 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 and terror. Um, uh, basically, most of uh, what these peop people had uh, New, known in, uh, in, in civil life, life was now um, gone. Uh, there is also, this was also the first war that put an end to the, you know, chivalry notion of, you know, face-to-face -face combat and, and uh, fair play and everything. Uh, and, and probably the, the, the worst moment was the Battle of Ypres, when um, the, um, it was the first time when poison gas, Iperit, was used and this was an invisible enemy, uh, it killed people without confrontation, so it put an end to all of these glorious images of, you know, um, chivalry combat. And um, then, uh, of course, it couldn't uh, um, oppose this invisible enemy only, it could only oppose it by wearing uh, gas masks like, like this. Uh, there was also uh, there were a number of violation of other rules of chivalry, like the you shouldn't use uh, prisoners to to work, or you should not um, humiliate them. But this happened again. There were new weapons again, uh, making uh, 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 making direct contact um, a thing of the past. In many cases, this is. Very powerful um, weapon. There was a Dicke Berta, uh, famous thick Berta, used by, by the Germans that could reach um, uh, targets uh, which were far away, much farther away than, than before. Um, and uh, then there were also the uh, tanks, which originally were developed from tractors, like this one. And um, uh, tanks also had this aura of invincibility that made uh, oh, this is less than invincible. Yeah, uh, then uh, that uh, um, uh, sprayed terror over the troops. Um, there were also uh, the war was also um, uh, fought from the air. Uh, with the use of zeppelins like this one, used for reconnaissance, but also uh, you had the beginning of um, um, 
airplanes uh, being used in, uh, in combat. Uh, the war caused a lot of destruction, uh, whole villages were razed and they, they caused this global devastation everywhere. Um, causing and creating nightmare landscapes like this one. Uh, death, of course, became a daily occurrence. Death was everywhere. And, and, and an incredible sense of fragility of human life was now omnipresent. Scenes like this were rather rare. This is actually an image of the Americans uh, intervening towards the end of the war in Italy. On the other hand, after the war was ended, uh, Life transformed itself. Cars like these became um, uh, widely available and affordable, especially in the United States, and they brought with them this sense of ease, of speed, of, uh, of possibility. Um, there were other devices like uh, these and these adverts, or the radio, the copying machines and all kind of, uh, of, of devices that changed the way people uh, communicated with each other. Uh, fashion also changed dramatically, um, maybe very much as a result of women having to take over the jobs that men had to desert when they were enrolled in the army and uh, they adopted a casual looking um, office dress uh, like uh, uh, shorter uh, gowns and more, uh, more casual uh, outfits that would uh, be fit with uh, such, uh, such uh, work. Uh, women, uh, after the war was ended, felt that they wanted to gain more rights, they were encouraged by the increased participation in public life, and they. this is the birth of the suffragette movement, okay, actually a second wave of suffragette movement, uh, with women entering the public sphere, demanding votes, demanding more rights, uh, uh, everywhere, this is a caricature, uh, making light fun at, uh, at this extraordinary change. Uh, note the gentleman on the right, who is doing the unthinkable, he's taking care of a baby, which was what used to be uh, the women's job. Um, now, over the next slides, we will be taking a look at three uh, things in correlation. And I'm gonna use uh, color-coded um, tags to indicate where we are. I'm gonna tag with red everything that has to do with the developments in society, that means history, politics, yeah? social life. Then in green, we will be dealing with um, influences coming from the field of science, uh, and that could mean psychology, anthropology, or even physics. And on the other hand, we'll be reaching what interests us in here, and this is literature and, of course, the arts as well on a blue background. So whenever you meet these colors in a vertical, vertical tag, they will indicate we are in uh, a society context, historical context, scientific context or literature. So let's start with some of the characteristics of <coughs> um, modernism and I'm trying somehow to indicate where there was um, um, an influence uh, from uh, uh, the developments of society or those of science, which ended up by impacting on literature and, and the arts. Uh, of course, I'm not trying to be deterministic. I'm not uh, suggesting that the arts just blindly followed the dictates of society or science. There was a correlation between these, and it's not a mechanical one. I hope this will be understood. Uh, so probably one of the first features, uh, features of modernism uh, that had a, an, an obvious influence in the way society, history, 
went was the loss of faith in the authority. Statues were tumbled down, statues of leaders, statues of powers. And um, the first thing that happened as a result of the, of the collapse of uh, the, uh, uh, at the end of the war was the collapse of many empires, the dismantling, dismantling of empires. And if you take a look at this map, you can see some of the empires that uh, were defeated at the end of the war and they crumbled, they, they fall apart, fell apart. Uh, there was Germany and there was uh, Austro-Hungary in, in this khaki color, which uh, split into several countries, Austria, Hungary, Czechoslovakia, Romania, and also parts of Transylvania, actually, and parts of um, uh, Yugoslavia. There was also the Ottoman Empire and all of these. And of course, there were also some losses um, from uh, uh, from the former Russian uh, Empire, Tsarist Empire, yeah, that uh, gave birth to an independent Poland, a Lithuanian state, Latvian and Estonia. Okay, now a second thing here, there was trouble in the colonies, colonial powers. Um, we are taking here a look uh, mostly at the British Empire. Um, lost a lot of its possessions, or at least they were being questioned. Mm, this picture here, this map here, shows how the British Empire looked around 1900. It was to become even larger by 1914, when a, a, a division of Africa happened among the, the great powers. So uh, it included, this division included the British, the French, the, even the Germans, the Italians, uh, the Portuguese, um, but after the war, uh, the British started having all kind of troubles. They didn't result immediately in um, um, demotion, in a, in a dissolution of um, the empire, but the process was was initiated, was triggered. Um, so there was the Boer War in South Africa. There was the Treaty of Wellington, and we have some little stars here coming. Yeah, the Boer War in, the, in South Africa. Then the Treaty of Wellington, which um, uh, initiated the process of home rule, of independence and autonomy in New Zealand and uh, Australia. There was also the Easter Rising that um, uh, sparked the movement that was to... Um, to um, end up uh, soon uh, with uh, island in independence. Easter Rising was in 1916, the mid-war. Um, <clears throat> so this is another map, oh, it's a bit uh, crowded with, with images. It actually indicated another thing that happened, that uh, some of the demands of the in, uh, for independence came from the fact that the colonies had sent a lot of troops to fight uh, in the First World War, which was primarily a European business. Uh, so they were, you, you had Australians, you had New Zealand soldiers, you had uh, soldiers uh, coming from India that fought at various um, moments in this war. And one of the demands that they had was that uh, they should be given more freedom since they helped so much the uh, the end of uh, the speeding of the end of the war. Um, another moment in this loss of faith in the authority would be the crisis, the various crises of monarchy that uh, hit the biggest um, uh, um, empires. Uh, the German uh, Kaiser, Wilhelm II, was the first to go by the end of uh, the war in 1918. Um, uh, that was the end of monarchy in Germany. The Austro-Hungarian um, uh, emperor, uh, Franz Josef, uh, died in 1916 and that was actually uh, uh, the death knoll of uh, his empire. And then also uh, in Russia, the Tsar Nicholas was executed by the Soviets, you know very well the, well, the whole story with Anastasia, 
in 1918. Uh, another uh, moment or another facet of the this loss of faith in the authority would be the religious crisis um, that affected some uh, layers of the population alongside with um, a dissolution of the traditional uh, family. Again, this is not a wide, these are not widespread movements, but they were just starting. So if we have to look at literature, how does that loss of faith in the authority translate here? Um, it translates basically with the shattering the rejection of the idea of the omniscient narrator. This is cracking over. That omniscient narrator that had dominated the art of the 19th century, the realism of the 19th century, suddenly appeared to be a paternalistic figure, a um, white male figure of, of sheer impossibility. How could one uh, claim that a book is credible, is to be believed, if it had at its center a narrator which was an impossibility, a narrator who knew everything, a narr narrator who was unaffected by the protagonist's um, sufferings or emotions, a narrator that could read minds, a narrator that had um, um, the knowledge of everything. This figure, I think, came to be associated with all of these figures, with all of these um, uh, figures of authority, of, of domination that we, we have seen uh, collapsing. Uh, how was this replaced? Uh, this was replaced mainly by subjective writing, by, by, by writing which was now rooted in the individual. The individual was now the one that um, whose, whose, um, uh, whose emotions, whose memories, whose uh, sufferings became central to the novel. The novel was less about the collectivity, more about the individual. There are other ways in which this, ha this uh, manifests itself. So uh, um, immediately, the immediate uh, um, um, consequence of this choice was the preference for first person uh, homodiegetic narrators. Homodiegetic narrators are narrators that are participants in the story. Uh, there were also experiments in unreliable narration. Uh, uh, people, narrators who no longer no longer can claim to have a, a complete knowledge of everything that's going on there. And uh, this is a good example from um, the Under the Volcano, a magnificent novel by Malcolm Lowry, where the um, protagonist, uh, jo Geoffrey Furman, uh, consul in Mexico, goes through the whole day of this novel in a state of total intoxication. He is completely drunk, yet brilliant and sparking and, and genial. Uh, there are other experiments in such unreliable narration, like Faulkner has a character who's a, a, a retarded boy, an idiot, a 33-year-old idiot boy in uh, The Sound and the Fury, and many more. Um, obviously, this went hand-in-hand hand with this growing interest in the individual rather than communi the community. The individual appears to be more um, tragically at odds with society. I'm not saying that this, this did not happen in previous literature. You all remember uh, Tess D'Urberville's Dur um, tragic fate uh, when, uh, when uh, she was rejected by, by society. But uh, the uh, perspective tends to be more and more that of the uh, individual uh, and um, even if that individual might be uh, solitary, even if that individual might be um, uh, a marginal, he deserves the writer's um, attention. Uh, I should also say that a lot of these novels, uh, especially in, in France, uh, tend to be about the crisis of communication between individuals. 
Um, and it's not just the genius, the misunderstood genius that cannot communicate with society, but this is also true for individuals. Each person is entrenched in their own, um, in, in a world of um, personal obsessions, as we have seen actually earlier in uh, Tristram Shandy by Lawrence Stern. Now, another feature that we'll have to look at is the development of psychology, obviously the science of psychology. And there are some very important discoveries that were made by the makers of psychology that had a huge impact on literature. So first we have to look at uh, William James, an American psychologist, the brother of, of Henry James, uh, an, um, an important um, novelist from America who authored several uh, books of psychology. This is one of, uh, one of them. Uh, what does he um, say? What does he have to say? Well, um, he uh, wrote about consciousness and he um, suggested that uh, our consciousness doesn't have the form we know from, uh, from literature. He speaks of consciousness in, in terms of stream, in terms of flow, and it's a mixed flow. It has in it feelings, thoughts, sensations. Not all of these are verbalized. Obviously, thoughts can be verbalized. It's difficult to verbalize a sensation. How, how do you verbalize? You don't verbalize um, a smell or uh, your response to, uh, to music or your response to, I don't know, loss of equilibrium. Uh, this stream keeps flowing. This is probably the most important thing uh, without fail. And there is a, a graph he had made at some point. Um, let's have a look at that. Yeah, this, this would be the development of, of one thought. Um, and he mentions that we have this constant change that um, there is a growth in, in our uh, mental interests. Yeah? There are phases that he calls substantive phases and tra transitive phases of the states of mind. The uh, substantive parts are those in which uh, the, the state of mind is constant, is, is, is is brewing, is developing, whereas the transitive parts are those in which they they, they keep changing, yeah, the, the, the movement. Um, a more complex graph is this, in which you can follow three states of mind, A, B, and C. And as you can see, each of them has its own dynamics. They coexist. At a given point, if you look where the, that uh, vertical line uh, crosses, you can see there that each of the uh, states of mind is in a, in a different position. Yeah, A is on the wane. A is kind of ebbing out. Yeah, the state of mind is is kind of disappearing from our conscience, whereas B is on its plateau phase, the substantive phase. It's it's at the apex, at the maximum. Whereas C is just beginning, it's the transitive phase of growth of it. And of course, these could be, these states of mind could refer not just to um, thoughts, but also, as we saw earlier, feelings, sensations, all of these. The term, a, a very important term that William James uh, mentioned was the term stream of consciousness. Yeah? This is the way he uh, uh, defined uh, all of these processes, stream as in a river. Uh, what is interesting is that this is this was one of the ideas that caught very very well with uh, writers. Whereas in science, stream of consciousness is a psychological phenomenon. It's just described like that. In literature, the writers tried to come up to invent a literary device to represent it. How can you represent these multiple thoughts happening at the same time? How can you do this in a linear in a linear medium, which is text? A text can only accommodate normally 
one line of thought. We are not like in music where a, uh, a partition for an orchestra would have, you know, three, four, five, six, ten, ten, twenty um, individual uh, lines for each instrument. Uh, we can't read this way. Uh, so they, the writers had to invent uh, ways of representing this. <coughs> And there are several ways, we'll have a separate discussion about it, those. I'm just going to mention here the most uh, radical one, and that, that is the stream of consciousness technique, which was pioneered by James Joyce in his monumental Ulysses. Uh, a technique in which he allowed several thoughts to, uh, to intertwine, uh, to pop up, ebb out, appear, disappear uh, in, um, in a very striking format, uh, the most extreme of his stream of consciousness moments, uh, Molly's monologue at the end of the novel, has um, consists of only one, actually three big uh, sentences that span over dozens of pages, there is no punctuation, uh, there are no uh, indications when one um, additional thought uh, pops in or when another disappears. But as I said, we'll have a longer discussion about this with texts on the table. <coughs> uh, Sigmund Freud is, is another iconic presence in uh, psychology. He's the father of um, um, psychoanalysis. Uh, this is a, a caricature, I guess, suggesting how important he was. This is the famous uh, uh, psychologist sofa or couch, yeah, where he would invite uh, his patients to uh, lie down and close their eyes and uh, um, and go with him and, and stretch uh, and, and, and impart their memories. <clears throat> the psychoanalytical method uh, tended to um, uh, uh, run an in-depth uh, research or, 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 um, or um, plumbing, if you wish, of the character's uh, most distant memories, some of them repressed, uh, in order to um, associate them as causes to present traumas, to present neuroses uh, that the patient was suffering from. Um, <clears throat> there is a very interesting um, model that this uh, practice result in, uh, resulted in. Uh, this is the German uh, presentation um, of it. Uh, and basically, uh, if we look from top down, uh, the very top uh, of his model, we have the super ego, yeah? which is what it's the world of values and norms uh, or, or representations dictated by the society's values and norms and it's about the demands that the society has upon us. This is our rational mind. Uh, lower, lower down we have the ich, yeah, ego and this is the critical understanding. This is, this uh, has, um, it's based on uh, control and on acknowledging what is what are the limitations that reality has upon you below that we have the id s and that's the a world we often repress and we are not aware of it has to do with stimuli it has to do with the libido, the sex drive and the death drive, the aggression drive that uh, um, Freud speaks about. And the principle at work here is the principle of desire, what we wish to do. These are our raw wishes before we meet the, the borders or the limitations of reality yeah, at the higher level and the limitations of society at the topmost level. Um, here's a simpler explanation of how this goes, yeah? Uh, if you look from uh, 
what is to the left is what was below in the previous picture yeah so it says i want it now yeah it's like a child saying well i want this at this very moment i don't care about this being possible or not i want it now on a higher level when we come to understand reality when we come to understand the physics of reality the ego reacts differently it goes with i need to do a bit of planning to get it i need i need to find a way to make it possible and at the topmost level the super ego goes with you can't have it it's not right that's what society tells you the normal uh, the moral norms of society uh, some uh, built um, from it uh, from all these um, model that some called the the iceberg model of the human uh, psyche and why why this um, um, image of a uh, iceberg because <clears throat> according to Freud the part that we are aware of from of, of our of our um, self the part we are conscious of is just the tip of an iceberg yeah as you can see there this ego and the parts of the super ego but the biggest part the biggest lump the biggest mass is the one we can't see is the one which is um, lying in, in in the depth and that is the unconscious the id why is this important uh, for writers because writers had found this model absolutely fascinating and they tried to go deeper they tried to let the, um, the their writing explore this under the water under the surface uh, um, iceberg Carl Gustav Jung is another important um, uh, psych psychologist um, a Swiss psychologist who uh, came with uh, several important concepts I'm just gonna mention those that had an impact on literature one of them is the, the idea of collective unconscious Jung suggests that well he kind of adds up to what uh, Freud had written and he suggests as you can if you look at this uh, image you can see that he um, adds one more element beneath the personal unconscious which Freud had defined he suggests that there is a deeper layer and it and that layer doesn't belong to individuals it's the collective unconscious it's what is the collective unconscious <clears throat> is everything that the human race accumulated over the, the thousands of years of their existence the fears uh, apprehensions desires uh, many of them uh, in which ended up in um, in cult cultural taboos or norms so um, often uh, the collective unconscious and the personal unconscious um, seem to uh, to operate with um, a similar vocabulary they operate with dreams and with symbols uh, the other uh, crucial term uh, that Jung uh, uh, created in direct relation with um, the collective uh, uh, subconscious is arch the archetype so archetypes he says are images and thoughts which have universal meanings across cultures and they may show up in dreams literature art or religion so in other words um, Jung is looking at, at uh, what we humans have in common. Is there anything that we have in common with, let's say, we Europeans, educated 21st century people? Is there anything we have in common with the uh, natives of the Amazonian rainforest, Mato Grosso, say, or with uh, the uh, Australian Aboriginals and there are things 
we uh, fear not the night. We、um, worship, we love the sun. That's very basic. And he, uh, uh, Jung, uh, noted that uh, these uh, uh, crucial fears, desires we have ended up crystallizing in, uh, uh, in different cultures in a very similar、um, vocabulary of symbols. Um, the light is always aspirational, is always uh, indicates uh, opening.、Um, going up,、uh, flying, resonates with our desire of freedom and autonomy. Going down is a symbol of collapse, of disaster, of danger. So, archetypes therefore are shared by the whole human race and they are part of this collective unconscious he was speaking about.、Um, there are several images he spoke of. Actually, originally Jung spoke of some uh, uh, feminine archetypes、uh, like Mary from Virgin Mary or Helen from Helen of Troy. And, but then this Uh, his model kept evolving, and you can find it、uh, on numerous、uh, places on the internet. There are all kinds of tests you can run to determine where you are, which archetypes exist. This, this is one which is derived from Jung, Jung、uh, the creator, the sage, the innocent, the explorer, the rebel, the hero, the wizard, and so on and so forth.、Um, <clears throat> so, An important、uh, remark by Jung is this an archetypal context expresses itself first and foremost in metaphors, metaphors and symbols, as we、uh, have seen. And that's where literature becomes important. So, arts, literature are important in Jung's、um, uh, theory because they help us coming into contact uh, with, uh, with this、uh, subconscious, this collective subconscious, through metaphor mostly. Um, I would also mention here the rise of anthropology,、uh, another new science、uh, which had its roots in the, um, some um, very organized and curious explorers of the previous centuries.、Um, and、um, the most important figure now is Sir James George Fraser, who is the author of The Golden Bow. Uh, Kranga de Aur, Ramura de Aur, a study in magic and、uh, religion. And, and this is a, a book that actually, in many ways, uh, uh, brought materials that, um, um, that were to be validated by Jung's、uh, theory of,、uh, of archetypes. So, Jung actually studied magic、uh, and religion. In a comparative way, he compared the religions, the, the magic in a lot of,、uh, a lot of traditions, and、uh, looked at their connections. Yeah, not by accident, the、um, uh, cover of his original edition has this intertwining, interlocking、uh, branches, which become、um, a symbol of how he sees cultures operating with. Essential, uh, essential uh, symbols and rituals.、Um, as a result of、um, Fraser's work, there was a growing interest in the exotic other in the arts.、Yeah? The, there were、uh, several exhibitions of African art held in Paris,、uh, bringing uh, uh, images、uh, to the public, bringing to the public images of masks. like Those you can、uh, see here,、uh, frightening,、uh, scary, fascinating at the same time.、Um, of course, these masks were now stripped of their original religious meanings and they were mainly displayed for their aesthetic and exotic, I guess, value.、Um, in the arts, there was a, an interest in those masks coming from the Cubists. And especially from Picasso, and I invite you to have a look at those genuine masks on the top and some of、uh, Picasso's uh, paintings, 
which uses mask probably as a you see as a pattern there's a lot of uh, similarities uh, in, in in the treatment in the rather brutal colors in the you know lack of modeling and nuancing of, of the color paste uh, so there is a primitive uh, rudimentary almost brutal aspect in those masks um, in literature there is uh, this this interest in the exotic uh, other manifested itself in the cultivation of a new primitivism and this is visible for instance in D. H. Lawrence's fascination with New Mexico natives and uh, the ritual in several of his uh, novels, but most uh, especially in *The Plumed Serpent*. Uh, also, an interest in the Australian Aboriginals in, in the same author, or in Malcolm Lowry's uh, fascination uh, with um, the Mexican uh, superstition. Uh, Al, um, Aldous Huxley uh, in uh, his Brave New World sees as the last um, um, uh, resource of natural humans again in uh, New Mexico, not Mexico actually. And one last thing, memory and time. We have seen already in, in, in some of the works we studied how important uh, time and memory were. There is a foundation in science behind that. And mostly, most and, uh, importantly, uh, all of this was um, anticipated by the work of the French um, uh, scientist Henri Bergson. Henri Bergson wrote uh, uh, several treatises, this is one of them, uh, matière et mémoire, matter and memory, yeah, a relation, uh, uh, an essay on the relation uh, between the body and the spirit. Uh, it looks rather philosophical, he was a philosopher, philosopher actually, but what do we have to retain from this? His work on the, uh, on memory. Uh, Bergson uh, created this funnel uh, cone of memory where the uh, P uh, plane is actually the present yeah? and the S is what we experience at the present it's just a point at the presence we only at the present we only have this very very small very narrow uh, contact with, uh, with, with with time and actually the cone goes uh, both uh, up in uh, towards the future which has uh, a number of possibilities for us and then it also goes down uh, and that's the cone of memory um, another in interesting um, um, discussion in Bergson is the fact that he took into consideration duration time as duration opposing on the one hand the exterior time in this graph is the one on the left temps exterior and the way we uh, conceive time inside we perceive time le temps intérieur interior time exterior time is the time as measured by clocks and interior time is the subjective duration durée subjective Dure intuitive, uh, which we uh, perceive internally. A brilliant um, uh, exploration of these notions can be found in Mrs. Dalloway by Virginia Woolf. Whereas we are most of the time we are intimately in contact with Mrs. Dalloway's perception of time. From time to time, at the end of chapters mostly, we are reminded that there is an objective time whenever we hear that Big Ben, the, the Big Ben clock, 
tolling, yeah, uh, uh, ringing the hour and marking, segmenting time in this mechanical way. Other ways in which uh, this knowledge of the relationships between time and memory functions um, occurred in literature. I should also mention here that there was an older um, conception of uh, the theory of associations, according to which our mind constantly jumps from objects we perceive now to uh, memories in relation to those objects or the faces we perceive now and our memories of those faces. So this is why apparently um, uh, our mind cannot be 100% present only in the, f in the present. It constantly jumps back. And we have an intuition, a very interesting intuition of this in a very early novel in Tristram Shandy by Lawrence Stern, which some of you might remi uh, remember, um, a series which was started, initiated in 1759. And there, some of you remember, we had that. This was actually a representation uh, by the narrator of what a work of art ends up, a work of literature ends up being. Instead of having a linear representation of time, we end up with these diagrams. And all of those bumps and, uh, and uh, hollows are moments when, when our mind cannot keep with the uh, present time, when we um, reminisce things, when we recall things, when we jump back in time, when we make digressions and uh, uh, as a result uh, Tristram uh, uh, Shandy uh, suggests that uh, it's impossible to have a novel that only consists of progression, that is of narration, of, of moving uh, in a linear w uh, way from point A to point B. Instead, we have to keep in mind that there are digressions. And digressions, many of them are the result of memory. Some of them are result of associations. Uh, some of them are just daydreaming, anticipations. We, you also have some, some, some uh, line in, in the graph, the, the one on, on the bottom, that um, is slanted towards the, the future. So... Uh, and instead of that, um, um, a good artist should design his work um, as, as consisting not just of um, the straight line of progression, but also of all the meanders of digression. Um, the first uh, European writer to really embrace memory and um, write a whole monumental work uh, based on the exploration of his subjective memory was the French Marcel Proust. At the beginning of the century, he published a monumental um, work entitled A la recherche du temps perdu, uh, translated into English rather unhappily as Remembrance of Things Past, and its publication had started in 1913. Proust um, um, is exploring his personal past not in a systematic way. He's not telling the story of his life from A to B. He constantly uh, meanders from one point to another. There is also the absolutely memorable moment of the Madeleine, which is a, some kind of a muffin, French, French cookie, uh, which the um, uh, author uh, tastes uh, at some point, and the taste of the muffin uh, brings back the involuntary memory, this is the one extraordinary moment of involuntary mem memory, uh, brings back the past. This is like the trigger yeah, to go back in the past. So that would be all for now. We'll